Okay, in this lecture, we will develop the uh, sinusoidal excitation response, the steady state response to sinusoidal excitation. And we have a very solid foundation that we've built up to this point, such that this can be developed very, uh, very efficiently, very quickly, and then we will have uh, time to just practice some problems so that you can become comfortable at determining the steady state sinusoidal response of a system. We're going to go back to our handy circuit that we've been using for a while now. So we have R1 equal to 2 ohms, R equal to 4 ohms, and C equal to a quarter farad. We have an excitation Vs, and we have a response Vc. And we have expressed the steady state response as H of S times Vs, where H has been found to be equal to 2 S plus, actually plus nothing, divided by S plus 3. Okay. Now, we want to consider, we now consider Vs equal to some constant, capital Vs, cosine omega t. That is our excitation. And we expect, we expect Vc to be of the same form. So we, this is consistent. We apply the DC signal excitation, we expect the DC response, the steady state. Now, all we're doing here is steady state. I need to really re-emphasize that because it's not like the, the transient natural response has gone away. We're just simply not interested in evaluating that at this point. We're focusing on, tell me what happens after a long while if I excite this network with the sinusoidal input. Tell me about the sinusoidal response across that capacitor. And so we expect that it will be sinusoidal in nature. It would be something like some constant k, cosine omega t, and it may have some angle theta. So there may be some uh, phase shift, phase lag, and there could be an amplitude that's going to be different than what we excite it with. That's in keeping with what we found so far. You apply a DC excitation, you get a DC response. You apply an exponentially decaying excitation, you get an exponentially decaying uh, response. And so the, the task really is going to be, well, we have to confirm that this is true, but if it proves to be true, then the task, whenever we solve these problems, will be simply finding k and theta. The, the constant, um, actually, let me, let me put this in here. Uh, this will be a little clearer. Let me put Vs, all right? Because V capital Vs is the magnitude or the amplitude of our excitation. So, so the response will be proportional in amplitude to the excitation, and that constant proportionality will be k, which is what we're going to need uh, to find. Now, let's consider a different excitation. And the reason for this is that it's expedient for analysis. Um, this excitation we will define as V S plus. Okay? The plus should remind you, think of uh, the complex plane. All right, and you'll see why in a moment. V S plus, and we will define this as capital V S times E to the J omega T, which we know by Euler's formula is capital V S times cosine omega T plus J sine omega T. This is a complex signal. We can't just go in the lab and produce you know, 9 e to the j omega t, because I don't know what some j volts means. Uh, this is an abstraction, all right? But it's a convenience that will help us to answer our real question, which is how, how does a system respond to an excitation that's cosine omega t? Well, we can use this, uh, this complex excitation to define or redefine our actual real excitation. And we'll say that Vs is equal to the real part of V plus Vs plus. Right? It's this piece right here. And the idea goes like this. If we can readily do analysis on uh, a system that's excited by Vs plus, by this e to the j omega t excitation, then, and, and we keep in mind that the actual excitation is just the real part of that, then when we, when we arrive at the response to our e to the j omega t excitation, we can simply pull off the real part of the response, and the real part of the response will correspond Will be to the real part of the excitation. All right, this is in keeping with this idea of superposition. We're studying a linear system. We're really uh, exciting the system with a real component 
and an imaginary component. The real component is cosine omega t. The imaginary component is j sine omega t. And so they have, there's a response that's due to the one component and a response that's due to the other. And we have found to date that if you excite a signal, a system, with a real DC voltage or a real exponentially decaying voltage, then the response is always real valued. I mean, we wouldn't expect that if you apply 10 volts to some system that we're going to get uh, J3 volts as a response. That just doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is that all of our coefficients in our equations of motion, which are really the values of the resistors and capacitors and inductors, are all real valued. So if you excite something with a real value, you're going to get a real value as a response. And similarly, if you could contrive of an imaginary excitation, like J10 volts, then we would expect that the response would be purely imaginary, not real. So based on that, we are, are going to um, uh, apply that to this case here, where we will do the analysis with e to the j omega t, but then the response that we find, we will only use the real part of it and not the imaginary part. And so we'll carry through that uh, right now. So we now define um, Vc plus, okay, is going to be equal to the transfer function h of s evaluated at j omega times vs plus. All right? Now we've seen this before, where the response is equal to the transfer function times the excitation. The only difference here is that we're, we're considering this specific excitation. h, then we have h of j omega times capital vs e to the j omega t. Now convert, or I should say express, h of j omega in polar form. So we'll have, I'll just keep going here. We have the magnitude of h of j omega, right, times e to the j theta, right, where theta is equal to the angle of h of j omega. If you're unclear on this, go back and watch the previous lecture on the complex math where we did a lot with h of s, h of j omega, times capital Vs times e to the j omega t. Let's keep going. Vc plus, then, is magnitude of h of j omega oops, times capital Vs. This is just a constant, a real valued constant here. Obviously, a constant that's dependent on omega, right? Um, but not a function of time. And it's real valued, always. Times e, and now I'm going to combine the e to the j theta and the e to the j omega t. So it'll be e to the j omega t plus theta, right? Where theta as before, it is the angle of h of j omega. And now I'm going to use Euler's formula to write cosine omega t plus theta plus j sine omega t plus theta. And I, can, I now see that this right, is the real part. This is the imaginary part. And we said that the, the response across the capacitor, Vc, is actually just the real part of this complex response Vc plus. Just as the real excitation Vs here was equal to just the real part of the complex excitation. And so now I can write magnitude of H of j omega times capital Vs cosine omega t plus theta, where theta is equal to the angle of H of j omega. This right here is K, and what we have found is that if I, let me write this one more time. So, we confirm that Vc is equal to K times the amplitude of the excitation Vs cosine omega t, same frequency as excitation, plus theta, where K is equal to the magnitude of the transfer function, and theta is the angle of the transfer function. And here, omega equals the frequency, this is angular frequency, of the excitation. Right? It's not arbitrary. These are, these are lockstep right? with whatever the excitation is. If you excite it at 100 hertz, 100 radians per second, you've got to evaluate the transfer function at 100 radians per second. And at this point, we realize that finding the steady state response to a sinusoidal excitation really comes down to something quite simple. It's simply finding k, 
the magnitude of the transfer function and theta, the angle of the transfer function. And we saw from the previous lecture that that really just comes down to having some efficient complex math. And so uh, in the next uh, portion of this lecture, or subsequent lecture, uh, we will basically start applying this and solving for the steady state response to sinusoidal excitation. We'll, we'll do some problems.